Hello, hello. Welcome. Claire Wasserman here, founder and author of Ladies Get Paid. Uh, we are an educational platform, global community, and of course, a book, if you couldn't tell, um, all about helping women earn more and live better. And it took me a very long time to condense that elevator pitch into one sentence. So there you go. <laughs> um, if you are familiar with Ladies Get Paid, way back when we used to host these town halls in person, it was how I began Ladies Get Paid. I had a lot of questions around... Um, why the heck there is a wage gap and a leadership gap, and most importantly, what we as individual individuals can possibly do. And that, of course, turned into, well, I got to make sure I'm closing my own wage gap, right? Am I asking for more? Am I negotiating my salary? So many layers to that. And I didn't have the answers to them, but I certainly had the questions to ask. So instead of doing panels, I decided I wanted to create something that was a little bit more of a peer-to-peer sharing experience because I think there is so much power in hearing the stories of others because there is not a one size fits all when it comes to advice in general, but particularly advice around money, right? It's There's a lot of privilege and baked into it. There's a lot of nuances um, and it exploded. I mean, that I think is the reason that we became successful was because the kinds of events that we were hosting was yes, sharing wisdom and being tangible and specific in that wisdom, but saying, listen, we, that wisdom can come from anybody and anywhere. And um, then of course the pandemic happened and we've gone virtual and stopped doing town halls, moved on to other things, much more focus on webinars, again, practical, tangible skills. But I've had that itch, that itch to come back to this kind of story sharing experience. And I'm going to go just in a second, I'm going to go into uh, my story around the guilt of charging more, emotional resistance to charging more. But before I do that, I want to explain how a town hall works. And of course, this is not an actual, you know, this is not a political town hall, which works a little bit differently. But I have asked six women who I really respect um, to share their stories as it relates to emotional resistance in raising their rates. And by the way, when you hear me say raising rates, that may sound like I'm only speaking to people who do freelance work or who are business owners. No, this is applicable to anybody who's ever had to put a price tag on their worth, which is guess what? If you're employed, that's the experience of negotiating your salary, right? So just know, even though you may hear some language around rates, raising rates, and there may be a lot of conversation around, you know, clients, specific clients, um, that's transferable to whatever situation you're in, full-time, freelance, whatever. But in these stories, these women are going to share, it's a little bit of like a TED talk. So they've each got five minutes, no pressure, uh, five minutes to bring us to that moment in time when they fully understood what was going on with them, with why is there this like Again, emotional resistance or guilt or hesitation to command what you are, quote, worth. And then from there, I'd love to open it up for anybody who feels moved to share. But something that would be extremely helpful is it's not just sharing the shit we go through, but how are we thinking about it? What are we going to do? What are the small steps that we can take to get us to some kind of next level to generate some sort of momentum to charging more? And for me, you know, I'll just tell you the reason I wanted to begin doing these town halls again, specific with this topic was because I had an aha moment when I was crafting a speech where I was saying like, get paid what you deserve and realize that that is an expression that I have been saying for years with not, without fully recognizing how like profound, I mean, it's, it's profound and it's complicated and requires a lot of unpacking because getting paid what you deserve implies that you know what you deserve. Okay. Which is both a deep inner worth, but also the, be, the ability to calculate that worth according to the market. So by the way, that has nothing to do with what you think you're worth, but has everything to do with what other people are willing to pay. What do they think your value is? which ultimately is the perception of your value. And by the way, what is your like place in the market? Okay. I mean, what are people willing to pay for you? What is your worth as defined by society? I mean, it's kind of bullshit though, this game that we have to play when you even think about like nurses and teachers, right? They should be paid way more, but they're not. So now we're stuck in this position where we have to make this market calculation. What do we think that we are worth according to others? Okay. But at the same time, protect a deep inner worth because, again, nurses and teachers should be paid more, yet they are not. 
So then we're kind of stuck in this, like both numbers game, but also the therapy around the numbers. Right. And I went and got my certificate in uh, a master's certificate during the pandemic in behavioral finance and financial psychology, because I recognize that it is not so much about the information around what to charge that stops us from charging more as it is how we feel about the information. And also you could be in the opposite where the market is telling you, you should charge a lot, but yet you don't. Why is there resistance? And so in that, and then I will wrap up my five minutes, which of course I went over. Um, but you know, I, I just want to lay it all out there that I, in some ways, am a hypocrite because I am constantly telling you all to know what you deserve, right? Or get paid what you deserve, know your worth. Yet I still struggle, uh, you know, a ton with this. Um, though I will say, in my defense, maybe I shouldn't call myself a hypocrite because I have said from day one that I started Ladies Get Paid because I needed Ladies Get Paid. Um, and just to make it concrete for you, the, the big resistance that I feel, and I'm sharing this in the hopes that we will all be transparent here, two things. I get resistance when I am I don't want to lose an opportunity, right? So if I don't want to charge too much for a speaking gig because I really want it, okay? That's one thing, fear of like not getting the gig. Then there's the other one of charging for things like boot camps or pro membership, right? Ladies get paid high value, high ticket prices. What stops me is a lot of things, but fear of inclusivity. And that, you know, if I charge too much, people aren't going to be able to afford it. And I want to help people. And I, there's a ton of you who agree with me. I know because you wrote me, you wrote in when you signed up and you said, somebody said, I think it's because we feel empathy for client situations. And rather than focusing on our value, we focus on their financial situation. Then another person wrote in, I spent 30 years in, non, in the nonprofit sector where your worth is connected to your quote mission, which you're supposed to love so much that you work for a pittance. That's the payoff in theory, which is the passion for saving the world. Um, my, the culture I spent so much time in doesn't support personal grain for profit and actually almost can punish you for wanting to make a good wage. So this feeling of more for me means less for you. And what I, I wanted to call this particular quote out that this person wrote in because she really is hitting home on what an impact our environment also has on us, right? This guilt or emotional resistance to charging more is not our fault. It is deeply entrenched to the societal ways of how we imagine, quote, women should be, um, which is let's not be greedy or let's not have power, right? And money is power. So it could also be fear of charging more because you could get wealthy, right? And then the last thing I just want to mention before I shut the heck up and, you know, zoom microphone over um, is that somebody said, the reason I feel guilty is because I wouldn't have been able to afford my own rates years ago. And that's why I think negotiating our salaries, the exploration of charging more is such a fantastic opportunity to really excavate our relationship with money holistically Okay, because there may be multiple ways that you interact with money that's very scarce. So it's not just about rates, but just scarcity in general that we then transfer onto other people. We assume because we couldn't afford it that they can't. And finally, truly in closing here, and then we'll pass it on and then we're going to talk about what actually we can do. I think it is always worth digging a little bit deeper. So whatever your emotional resistance is, if it is initially manifesting as fear of not being inclusive, right? Empathy to others. I, I want to challenge us to go just a step beyond to see if there might be a more difficult emotional truth that is lurking underneath. So inclusivity, desire to be inclusive. That's my obvious reason I don't want to charge more. But I think the deeper, more difficult emotional truth is that I am not good enough because I know that my services will always improve. So if I charge a big amount now, my goalposts keep moving. And that's also why what we charge should keep changing. We evolve. So this calculation of our market rate and how we feel, it's not like you set it and you forget it. It requires us to continually come back together and discuss it. That's why I wanted to make this the topic of our first town hall. Uh, and I'm going to throw it over to, I hope that was helpful for some folks, although of course, you know, we got to go into the tangibles and I promise we'll get there. So 
Let me bring um, up to the stage, Kara Stevens. I know she needs to leave um, at 30 after. So Kara, if you wanna, um, let's just go into here. I am actually, da, 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 da. let me see, Kara Stevens, there you go. I'm gonna ask you to unmute and I'm gonna have you replace me. Um, and I would love for you to share your story. I mean, just a quick intro for Kara. She um, runs, or she's the founder of The Frugal Feminista, which is a thriving personal finance and personal development company committed to helping people, and particularly women of color, heal their relationships with money and themselves. Kara is like way back in the day, ladies get paid. Um, and I always have a soft spot for anybody who was there in those you know, downtrodden early days. Um, Oh, people said that they're trying to join, but it's capped. That makes no sense. We have way more than a hundred ability to allow a hundred people in here. All right. Well, Kara, I'm going to have you go ahead and share. Um, and then on my back end, I will try to figure out what's going on. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for that. And just thank you for creating this platform to have these types of conversations. So I'll just share my story. Um, I've had so many, but I would say that there was this one, when I first started The Frugal Feminista, um, I was experiencing so many blocks emotionally about charging women that look like me um, money to help them heal their relationship with money. That's the irony. Um, but I realized that I was getting more resentful um, every time I felt I had to reduce my rate. Um, I felt more, I felt angry um, that women weren't seeing my value. And what up happening that my first year of entrepreneurship, you guys, I gained like 30 pounds, right? Because I was so stressed. Um, I was not attending to my being a good mother or being a good wife because I had fixated um, on that. I had fixated on the idea that I should not charge more, even though there was so much evidence in my life telling me that what's keeping me from working more hours. I was an entrepreneur, but I was basically having six to seven side hustles, you know, in order to make my means meet because honestly, similar to what Claire was saying, I honestly was mad at women that look like me. But if I was really honest, I was afraid of abandonment, right? I was afraid of being kicked out of the club because in my community, and I'm a first-generation American um, immigrant from the Caribbean, but for any of us that are first-generation or um, immigrant families, you don't put money with family. And the women that I worked with, the women who I wanted to help build their relationship with money, they were letting me into their homes, into their finances, into their purses, telling me all of their business. So I was like, how can I charge this woman who's now calling me sister and sis? And I want you to come see my kids. And the kids were in the Zoom behind saying, hi, Auntie Kara. How am I going to charge this woman money? Right? I felt bad. But then I would go home and not be able to have time with my daughter, have time with myself. My health was suffering. And I still wasn't meeting um, my particular goals. What was the point of pursuing a a of a career or a passion that you love if you weren't enjoying it. And so my biggest call, I guess, my biggest call to understand how I had to shift was I had to start going back to therapy, y'all, honestly. This pushed me back into therapy and I started to unpack all of my cognitive distortions. I started to unpack and notice my how I catastrophize, right? When you catastrophize, you think the world's going to come to end if you um, do something or don't do something. I had to look into my people pleasing. Who are people pleasing in the house? Come on now. All right, I'm not alone. I'm recovering, so receive that. I had to deal with the people pleasing. And growing up, and this is where it comes deep, and the book that I write, I wrote a book called Heal Your Relationship with Money that talks about what were my childhood messages around asking for what you want. Because I was taught that your interests are not that important if it doesn't support the common good of more people. And since I came to serve, you know, women who were struggling with money, I would be the person who should be the last one to ask for money or even think about it. 
there was a nobility in martyrdom. There was a nobility in sacrifice. And this was a juxtaposition of still having to have this entrepreneurial dream and this desire to be independently wealthy. Oh, she has the book. Nice. Who, who's that? Pam. Thank you, Pam. No, but seriously. So when I started to go back to therapy, I found myself not talking about money per se, but just the patterns that my therapist helped me um, pinpoint and surface with that, you know, Carrie, you, you, um, you read another part of the thing with the cognitive distortion was reading people's mind. How do you know that they can't pay for it? What assumptions are you making about the people that you're serving? And that helped me begin to see that I had some preconceived notions about the women that I wanted to serve. Yes, they didn't have money then, or they had problems with their relationship with money, but that wasn't going to be forever. And two things can be true. They can have um, current or problems with their relationship with money now and still find a way to pay me because they see value in me. And so I had to break apart these either or conversations in my head and go to a both end. I can say Claire definitely has to heal her relationship with money and she has to pay my rate. So let's find some creative ways that you can come up with the money. But what was not going to be an option uh, um, ultimately was that I could, my needs had to be met as a businesswoman in a client coach relationship. And I had to understand that first. And I was able also as a practical way, um, I was able to gift one or two people at my choosing who I would do something at a reduced rate or by donation. So that allowed me to say yes when I wanted to and absolutely not when I had to, because I, as an entrepreneur, had to fund my own retirement. I had to hire staff. I had to pay for expenses. And you know, Uncle Sam wants his money, right? So you can't play with him. So I had to look at it from how can I have compassion for myself, my financial goals, and the woman that I serve. And once I was able to do that, I started to think about two things and ask for practical steps. What can I do right now? So I read this article many years ago talking about happy and sad prices. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that article. So I'll give it to Claire as part of like the, um, the recap email. But this article talked about thinking about a number that makes you happy when you think about it with respect to your services. And then also thinking about any other emotion that may come with it. Is it anxiety? But moving towards that number doesn't have to happen like that. Moving towards that happy number, that happy price can be recursive, but you can give yourself some grace. So let's just say you're currently charging $500 and the happy price is a thousand, but it makes you uncomfortable not a problem. Try for the next client, $600, right? Try for the next client, $700. And by that second client, try for the thousand. Or what you can do is ask your friend to send the rates for you. If you have an assistant, you can separate yourself from the possible idea of rejection because that was another piece I had to deal with. I felt personally rejected when someone said that your prices were too high, it was almost like they were calling me out my name, right? It made me feel like I had betrayed them. So a way for me, and I still do this, um, when something I know I should do it, but I'm not necessarily the best person to um, pull the trigger, I craft the email and I ask someone else to send it. Or if I don't wanna send it at, the, at that exact time, you know how you can schedule your emails and you go about your business, schedule for a couple of days, and it's almost as if you forgot about it because life continues to life. And then you'll be surprised that you're more removed from the situation because you're not necessarily looking to have a response right away. And I found that those two things have helped me. And the third thing I would say is that I've created a fact file, a fact file of all the things that make me so boss, right? And all the reasons why anyone would be happy to be in my company and to actually have the outcome that they are asking me to help them do. So my fact file goes, it, it deals with business, it deals with finances, but also just deals with the kind of person that I am. I'm kind, I'm compassionate, uh, I'm resourceful. You know, I have, um, I'm able to see uh, nuances and things and synthesize for people and put it in simple ways so they're able to understand. 
I have a lot of great things about myself that I realize you should be very happy the same way I would be happy to choose you if I'm choosing you, that they, those are the things that those people are seeing about you and that's what they're happy to pay for. And I think that was another thing I had to begin to think about was like, why am I assuming that people aren't happy to pay me? I decided to change my assumption. People are happy to invest in themselves because the way I look at money isn't exactly the way that they look at money. Some people are actually quite offended, you guys, if they are not charged full price. They think that you don't think highly of them if they feel like they have to get a handout or a discount. And once I was able to be massage those ideas into helping me understand that a lot of the work for me has to be one of me rethinking my relationship with money, my relationship with scarcity, with rejection, with this fear of not belonging because I'm sticking up for myself and I'm no longer people pleasing. It, that's when my um, rate started to change and how I believed resources and opportunities were out there. There are times when, yes, I may outprice someone or outprice an opportunity, and I'm okay with that because I read this book. It's called Mama, Genius, Mama Gina's Art of Having Your Way with the World. There's this one, and I'll put the resource there too, is that there's more greatness waiting for me around the corner. And once I'm able to say that, people want to pay me and compensate me. People want to work with me and they're willing to do what they have to do in order to do so. I begin to have less anxiety. I begin to um, have less attachment to the outcome. I can only be myself when it comes to money and working on removing uh, more and more of those mindsets. And once I'm able to do that, I'm able to freely put the price out that I want for now because I know that it can change and let things happen as they happen and still continue to see why I add value to a conversation, why working with me is a unique and wonderful experience, the, um, the receipts that I have from having done so before. And it just makes sense. The numbers just begin to make sense. So I know that's probably like my five to seven minutes, um, Claire, but I hope that was helpful in terms of, you know, helping you see that you are not alone. This is all a journey and every new level, like I'm thinking about five and six figure contracts now. And don't, let me tell you, I, be, I get scared, but I honor the fear and still move forward using the same strategies that I have before, because I know that that fear too is temporary and the doing and the asking is what makes the fear go away. So, 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 so good. You're, you're the best. Uh, I mean, I have lots of more things I'd love to ask you, but I know you need to run and we've, we're going to jump over to other folks. I think one of the most profound things you said that is just such good life wisdom is the capacity to contain multitudes that it's not either, or oftentimes it's an, and, um, and somebody even in the chat, you know, spoke to that with the situation that they are in where they declined work, you know, cause it was too low. They feel empowered by it, but they're also disappointed. Right. So like two things can be true at once. And I think oftentimes we, that feels conflicting to us. So we want a binary, but that actually then makes our world smaller. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you hop off. Um, and I'm going to now ask, uh, Chelsea, I'm going to bring you up my love. I'm going to add you, uh, do, 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 replace me. Um, and then just a quick little intro for, um, lovely Chelsea Brennan here. Uh, Chelsea is the founder of smart money mamas, which is on a mission to help moms build meaningful wealth without the hustle. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank God for you. Share your story. I can't wait. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Hello, everybody. First of all, can you guys tell me that you can see and hear me? My five-year-old was working, sitting in my office the other day and decided to cut my headphone and microphone cord, which is always a fun thing for them to do. <laughs> and he came out and he went, oops. And I'm like, yeah, you accidentally cut this cord. Um, anyway, so I am Chelsea Brennan. I'm the founder of Smart Money Mamas, as Claire mentioned. Um, I also run too many businesses. I have a tendency to, I have ADHD, I like to do a lot of things. Um, so I also run a sticker and stationary company called Wildly Enough um, and another business called emergencybinders.com. And I want to talk about this for a second because my story of this, and Claire reached out to ask me to do this, I kind of was like a deer in headlights of what would I even talk about in five minutes? Because there's so many different things. And my business partner and I got on the phone and we kind of talked it out. And the reason that I come at this from a different way is that I started my career on Wall Street. Um, I worked at Goldman Sachs. I moved to a hedge fund. And as a very young person, 
I used to make what we call stupid money. My husband and I would be like, what person in their right mind decided that a 25 year old could manage a billion dollars at a hedge fund and could be paid mid six figures at this money. Right. And so, and then right before we had our second kid, I left that job to start Smart Money Mamas. We went from this super high income from our age bracket down to zero. And there was so much mindset work that I had to do around rates and charging, especially because um, a lot of what we do at Smart Money Mamas is similar to what Kara was talking about, is healing money mindsets and healing relationships with wealth. And my big hang up, guys, my big wake up call hang up was that I had tied my self-worth to net worth. I had a parent from a very young age who was obsessed with money, who was obsessed with wealth. And I had internalized that my worthiness of love and belonging was tied to how much money was in my bank account. And as I walked away from my old job and healed that mindset, then I had to come to terms with, okay, how do I balance charging the right amount for my services. And as Claire mentioned earlier, I kind of hate the phrase charging what you're worth because we can't put a dollar value on anybody's worth. Um, but charging appropriate rates, when I felt like if I was asking more, I was falling back into old habits, right? Am I coming to a place where I'm tying this self-worth, you know, I kind of almost rejected wealth for a little bit for, for a while, trying to find that balance, especially when I'd gone into what I really viewed as a helper career, right? The point of Smart Money Mamas was me to take all this knowledge that I learned in high finance and pass it on to the people who actually needed it um, and really doing it in a way that we could build lifestyles that we wanted, that we looked at wealth more holistically. And then when we started Wildly Enough, which is an artistic business, right? This is this is a totally different ball game for me, who as a kid grew up being told I wasn't creative because I was good at math and science. You very much get kind of siloed of like there's the creative kids and the numbers kids. And so I was put in that numbers bucket. We are taught, we have this whole societal thing about how you know you're selling out as any kind of creative person as you charge more money, that you the starving artist, right? This whole idea. And you see it in helpers too, that if you have this mission, the mission should be more important than the dollars in the bank. And so in both of those realms, I've had a lot of these instances. Yes, very much the same as nonprofits, Margaret, as you just saw in the comments. And so for me, it's really come back to what is my level of security? And so this is a part that we talk about, my husband and I, of what is our, our happy number? What is our number that we feel safe and comfortable and that we're pro providing for our kids' future? And how do we build that into what we do and how much I want to work? Um, I'm going to give two quick examples here of times that this popped up for me. Um, about two years ago, a big financial institution reached out and they wanted to do these educational videos. They wanted me to record five or six videos and they asked me what my rates were. And honestly, I'd never done this kind of video content where I was handing over the IP. We'd done um, sponsored videos before. We'd done that kind of content, but we'd never done like, okay, you're going to own this now. And I had no idea what to charge. And all I knew was that they wanted five or six one minute videos which let's be honest, guys, is going to take me an hour. Right? Like, this is not a hard concept. They were asking me to do very basic things like explain how a 401k works in a minute. right? So I had no idea what to charge. I'd come up with a number with my husband and I, and I was like, should I send this or should I just ask them what their budget is? And it was a period of time where we really wanted to, we really needed this money, right? This was a contract that was going to kind of help us in that moment. My husband's a stay-at-home dad. We were still getting on our feet, this whole thing. And so I decided we were actually out with the boys going, taking them to the aquarium. And from my phone, I just wrote back and was like, you know, I've never done this type of work before. Give me a sense of what your budget range is. And I can come up with a quote for you. It was like all I wrote back and they wrote back and guys, I'm not kidding. Their budget was four times what I thought that I was going to ask them to pay for this video. And I had a whole mental struggle there of, am I taking them for a ride? Like at this point, right? Like I've this guilt about this is so little work for me. It's <laughs> so much money. And then also, you know, talking through and thinking through with my business partner, like, Hey, um, I can do this in an hour because of the years and years and years and years I've done this work. And so it's okay now for me to charge that because they're not paying for the work it is now, they're paying for all of the experience. The second story I'm going to tell real quick is actually on the, the other side, this wildly enough side, because I want to take it a little bit outside 
the contract work, which I think is what a lot of people here are going to talk about in salary work. So we are a primarily wholesale business. About 80% of our income from Wildly Enough comes from selling to small boutique businesses. We primarily work with independent bookstores. And one of the things that you do with wholesale is that you set your minimum order amount to be a wholesale client um, and your MOQs, which is your minimum order quantity per design. And we were working, We this business kind of came out of left field. We have a course that we run with Smart Money Mamas called 30 Days from Passion to Profit, where you start a business in 30 days. The first time we ran the course, we were like, how could we make this more impactful? And Lauren and I decided to start a business alongside all of our our students. And this business kind of took off on its own. On its So it's always been this kind of passion project side hustle for us, even though it's grown now into a full-time business. And so we had started with really low minimum orders and MOQs, and we'd seen this growth that we weren't expecting. And there was a lot of fear around, you know, we still have a hard time calling ourselves artists, even though we do all the design. We still have a hard time looking at this as not just a side hustle, side project. And we were worried that if we upped our rates, all of that was going to go away, right? Like, okay, you'll value us at this low minimum order amount, but if I raise it, it's all going to disappear. And so we had a, you know, we, we have a course that we take around this, around this business. And the instructor was like, your rates are way too low, way too low, way too low. So we finally upped them. We tripled our minimum order amount. And Lauren and I were terrified. This was just the beginning of this year. Our orders are up so much since we changed it, the quality of our customer, the reduced amount of time it takes us to pack orders, all of these things changed. We were able to hire someone part-time to, to help with us. So all of these things have changed. And it really was one of those instances, again, of like, hey, you, when you put your put a better value on the work that you do and you're willing to own the value of that work, the right people are going to come back to work with you, right? The customers that only wanted to order at our minimum amount and wanted to nitpick about everything, they really went away. Um, and so this has been a journey for me. And it's not one that I can sit here and say that I am anywhere near done with balancing kind of this like 30 years of financial mindset about self-worth and net worth and charging what I need to, I'm still working on. But these are some instances where it really popped up for me that, it turns out the right way when we step up um, and really charge what our work it should be worth in the marketplace. Incredible. Uh, yes, all of that. And I'm loving the chat. People are totally agreeing with you. And I also love that you, one of my favorite things you said, because I think about it all the time, is to not charge or to not just think about what you're charging in terms of the hours that it takes to do that mm. specific work, because it took you so many years of life experience leading up to this point. And today is not a conversation to get into like, do we charge hourly or per project? Cause we, that there's other things around that, but I'm always hesitant for people to think in terms of hourly, because if you're excellent at something, it shouldn't take you long, but remember it took you a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and we're going to hop over to Yanelli Espinal. Um, where are you, my love? Um, and have you jump up I'm here. here. Yes. We're going to add hey. you to her screen and I'm going to pop you off and, um, would love for you to share. And again, as always for everybody listening, these, the structure, of this is we're going to go around, kind of share our personal journeys with guilt and emotional resistance to raising our rates, and then open it up for a discussion with questions. Cause you may have heard things from Chelsea, et cetera, where you're like, Oh, I want to know more. Um, which of course, in the meantime, feel free to jump in the chat, but yes, all you welcome. Welcome. Oh, wait, I should probably introduce you. Although, um, you'll be better at it yourself. Um, something that I love that you describe about yourself is that you are a Brooklyn born ball of energy. Um, and Yanelli Espinel is also uh, has a great channel called Miss Be Helpful, which is over 4 million views. It's all around basically personal finance, but in a very straightforward, reassuring, relatable way. Um, 
Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Claire. This invitation was amazing. I was so happy to join. I know that I needed this when I was getting started. Um, for full disclosure, I still technically am a nine to five employee. I am the director of educational outreach at a nonprofit called NGPF. Um, I've kind of worked my way down to three days a week with them, even though technically I'm full time on paper, which is amazing for me because it just frees up way more time nights and weekends, Mondays and Fridays for me to work on my business, which is Miss Be Helpful LLC. And it started as a YouTube channel, just me sharing, you know, credit stories how I got out of credit card debt and how I was learning money basics. And then eventually it led to a real passion around making sure schools actually teach financial literacy. And so a lot of my work today is actually working with lawmakers to pass laws to actually introduce bills that will become the law that requires a full semester of personal finance in high schools in the United States. So we're working on getting all 50 states. Right now there's about 18, 19 states. Next, I think next week is going to be the 19th state. Today I had a really good call about that. But anyway, um, I kind of wanted to do like five and five. So I got five things that I've learned in, in, in these five minutes that I'll share with you. The first one is to know what's fair. I grew up in a first generation household. My parents are immigrants. They don't speak English. They came from Dominican Republic with no money, no education, no connections. And it was a cash only household. My parents were really ashamed of the conversation of money because they grew up in poverty in another country and didn't really have um, a lot of knowledge about how to talk openly about money or even how to manage money. So I watched my mom, who is extremely talented and so entrepreneurial and crafty and resourceful. She will literally turn anything into something useful. And I watched her sew pretty much my whole life. She's a seamstress, but not, you know, through proper training, but more that she learned on her own and with her, my grandmother teaching her. But she was the seamstress in the community. Like, I grew up in Bushwick in Brooklyn. Everyone knew my mom to make their Sweet 16 dresses, their graduation dresses, their baptism dresses, prom dresses. Everybody was in my house getting measurements from my mom. And yet I would watch her toil over the sewing machine with her hunchback. We late at night sewing, sewing, sewing. And when people would come to her and say, okay, you know, how, how much do you charge? She would say, you know, well, just you go buy the fabric. And then for me, you know, I'll just, you could just, just give me $50 or, you know, you could just give me $20. After I literally saw her through the night, breaking night on that sewing machine, turning this piece of fabric into a beautiful dress, like it didn't make any sense to me. And I even remember some really hard projects where she would be working like on leather. Leather is a really hard fabric to sew. She would work on leather pants with patchwork. It was all intricate, such a hard time and tell them just $20. So, you know, I watched her do that. And then it's so funny because earlier Carol was talking about therapy and in therapy that came up for me, which is this generational trauma. And maybe, you know, people don't consider that to be generational trauma, but I do because I've repeated negative cycles around feeling shame and guilt and not, you know, knowing how much to charge. And so just feeling ashamed of even saying a number that felt like it was high for me. And I think a lot of that came from growing up in poverty, but a lot of that also just came from witnessing my mom, who's, you know, a big influential woman in my life doing that herself. So for me, it was knowing what's fair. That's not fair. That is not fair for her to toil for hours through the night and not even get $25, $30. It, it didn't even make sense. So for me now, as I, before I even think about the market and comparing myself and researching and looking at what competitors are doing, I don't care. For me, it's what is fair for me, for my time, for my effort and my expertise and craftswomanship, right? That's what I want to make sure I'm charting something that is fair to me. And so the first thing is, you know, think about what's fair for you before you think about anybody else. If it doesn't feel fair for you, it's because it's not. And if you're not sure about what's fair and what's not, uh, second Kara, therapy. Therapy really helped me to figure out that that's not fair and that there's something rooted, you know, from generations before me that might be hindering my ability to feel comfortable saying that's not fair. Um, so the second thing, first one is know what's fair. Second thing is know how to sell. Once you figure out what is fair for you, Selling is basically just communicating your passion. I feel, I realized that at first I wasn't selling anything. I was just being really passionate. And people were just offering me money. People were like, oh, can you come to my church and do a workshop? You know, we have a budget. I wasn't even selling workshops. I was just making videos on YouTube. But for some reason, people saw them and were like, this passion, I mean, it felt like I was selling because I was just communicating how truly passionate I was about everybody learning basics of money management. That's how my business started. I would go to community centers, to uh, churches, to schools, and just do workshops. And I would take whatever amount of money they had in their budget because I saw it as just giving me a chance to practice and like hone my craft of being in front of people rather than in front of a camera. But I got to tell you, knowing how to sell 
has come in handy. Even if you don't think you're selling, when you're transferring your passion for what you do to someone else, you're making a sale. So get really good at selling and don't feel like selling is a dirty thing because I always thought sales was dirty. And when I stopped thinking of sales in that way and just realized that what I'm doing is giving them my passion and transferring it to them and giving them the ability to use their resources to get some of that passion and build up their own, like I just stopped thinking of sales as a dirty thing. Um, and then also for me, that comes with confidence. If you don't really have confidence in what you're selling, how are you going to expect the customers to pay you? You barely have confidence in it yourself. So you really have to work to the point where you're confident about what you're selling and the value that you bring, which, you know, was mentioned um, already, but I can't emphasize enough. Um, the third thing I would say is know the market. Know the market that you're in. Of course, compare yourself to competitors. Look and see, you know, what are they charging? Am I undercharging? Am I overcharging? And it doesn't matter if you're under or overcharging if you want to be. But if you don't want to be under or overcharging, then that, then that might matter. In which case, you might want to think about where your services compare and where they fit in the market. Uh, for me, that was just looking at other women who do similar work, speaking engagements, blog posts, you know, affiliate and partnership work online and work working with companies and just asking them, just straight up asking them, hey, what do you charge? I saw you spoke at this event. That was amazing. Congrats on that gig. What did they pay you for that? If you're willing to tell me, it would be so helpful because I'm starting to get similar requests. I have had, in my experience, I've had no issues. Women have been amazing. And I mean, that might be specific to the financial space, but maybe not. Women are incredibly willing to share. They will tell me exactly how much they made, what the exact terms were. I've even had a woman send me her contract that she signed, like in detail. It was like, yeah, look, here's the contract that I signed. Amazing, right? That helped me to know the market. So I had confidence increasing my rate, especially when dealing with corporate clients and not just individual uh, you know, ticketed sales. Um, the, the fourth thing I would say is know how to grow with empathy, because the reality is this, look, you just got to recognize this fact, raising your rates is a natural and necessary part of running a successful business. That was a hard fact I had to accept. It's a hard pill to swallow, but inflation is high every single year. Your money's worth less. So what you're charging is worth less. So you need to increase as time goes on. That's just a fact, right? And it's, it's economics. But the reality is you don't want to do it in, an, in a sloppy way. And I have a quick story for this, actually. A good friend of mine, we, she and I have been going to the same salon for a very long time. And then she changed her salons. And she went to a different salon with a different hairdresser and just loves, loves, loves this new hairdresser. I stuck with my old girl because I really like her. But she keeps bragging about this new person who's doing her hair and will send me pictures and stuff every time. And recently, she called me and she was so upset with this hairdresser. And I was like, what is going on? You love this person. You've been bragging about her since you changed. And she's like, you wouldn't believe it. I walked into the salon. Everything was the same as normal. I sat down. They brought me her mosa. Everything was all cute. It's like a fancy salon in New York City. Super high in experience. Everything was great. The same as normal. And then when I go to pay, it was nearly twice as much as I always pay every time I go to her. And I've been loyal with her for so long. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. This is a mistake. You know, this isn't what I was supposed to be charged. I come to her all the time. It was supposed to be this much. That's what I'm used to paying. And they were like, oh, no, no, um, you know, this is the new rate. And so she called over her hairdresser like, um, excuse me, <laughs> what is this is way more than I expected. And she just her hairdresser just looked at her and said, oh, yeah, I raised my rates and then walked away. She lost a customer that day. So the thing is, it's not because the rate was increased. I'm sure my friend would have been willing to pay it. It was the way she felt so disrespected that as such a loyal client who's been coming to you, you couldn't even give me a heads up when you handed me the mimosa, when I booked the appointment, you couldn't send me an email and say, hey, you know, rates are going up. Yesterday's price is not today's price. You know, anything. Just the fact that you can come at this with empathy, knowing that your customer should be aware before you just roll up on them with twice the price. It's okay if it's if your business necessitates it, but it's not okay for you to just do it and pop up on people with a surprise, surprise, twice the price. Like you have to kind of do it with empathy and communicate with your clients so that they can continue that trust and loyalty and that relationship they have with you. And you don't kind of put a bad taste in their mouth about what you did. So for me, that story stuck with me. And I will always use that when I'm going to grow. I want to make sure I grow with empathy. And that means when I increase my rates, I give my customers a heads up. Um, and then last but not least is a fifth one, which is to know when to ask for help and seek support.
I have been running my business by myself for way too many years. And last year and this year with a major shift, I actually hired a team. I have a VA, I have a PR person, I have an agent. My agent alone, just in negotiating rates for me, when I tell you, I used to get a couple thousand dollars for a 20 minute, 30 minute talk. Now the same 20, 30 minute talk will get me tens of thousands of dollars. And it's because I didn't know really how to negotiate that my expertise, right, is to show up and inspire to, to, you know, be a financial advocate, to teach what I've learned and to tell my story and to teach. I mean, my, my training, I literally have a master's in education. So my training is to teach. I don't get joy from doing that negotiation. And I had to be real with myself about why is it that this is kind of such a hard thing for me in therapy. It came up like, why am I not delegating that? If I don't enjoy that, if that's not where I'm so excited that piece of my business doesn't have to be done by me. But my agent and I agreed on what my base rate is going to be. Now, moving forward, if I get an email with an invitation to speak, I say, what's your budget? If it's under my base rate, I say, no, thanks. Not able to do it this year. But if you you know, if you have a higher budget next year, feel free to reach back out to me. And if it's that budget or higher, it gets forwarded right to my agent. So to me, knowing when to seek that help and knowing when to step back and say, that's not my area of expertise. I don't get joy from that. Just know when to seek that support so you don't feel like you're doing it all alone while also trying to challenge some of the generational trauma or some of the issues that you're having emotionally with charging more for, you know, whatever reasons uh, those may be. Okay. That's my five and five. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I'm so, there were so many things you said that were fantastic, particularly for me. I think you mentioning generational baggage. Uh, we all carry it in all different ways. Um, and so I think if you, you know, the first step to exploring your relationship with money is to see if you can go way back to what was your parents or the people who raised you, you know, what was their relationship with money with their parents and growing up. Um, and you can start to see how this stuff gets transferred. Um, we are going to be, we're running a little late. I'm going to have Lena um, West. So you are going to jump up here. Let's just see. I'm here giving you yes. jazz hands. Yes. You perfect. See me? perfect. Perfect. All right. Replace. You, gonna... see me? you see me? All right. I'm so happy you're here because also you commented in the chat. My mammy was 40 years old and didn't want to spend $30 on a laundry hamper. I will always remember that to the point of yeah. understanding how generational baggage gets transferred. Let me just introduce you real quick before I hand over the mic. So Lena West is the founder of CEO Rising, which is a virtual business accelerator dedicated to transforming, I love this, principled solopreneurs into CEOs by providing them with the three growth tools they need most, coaching, community, and cash, so they can build ethical, profitable, and sustainable businesses. That's very much that and sort yeah. of thing that, that Kara, I believe, was talking about. Yep. And I know you're going to kill it. And by the way, guys, if y'all need to jump off at the hour, I get it, but we clearly we're running late and I want to keep talking. So stick around, you know, we'll, we'll keep going as long as we need to, but all you, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Blair. Um, I love what Rachel is saying to chat. You're not embarrassed by how much you're asking for. You're not asking for enough. Yes. I love it. I love it. So um, I too thought about like, okay, so what am I going to talk about? And I decided, I said, Claire, I think I want to tell him my hundred thousand dollar story. And she was like, well, you could surprise me the day of, but I would like to hear it now. So like to hear it, here it goes. So many years ago, um, I was working with a coach um, to expand how I wanted to run my business. So just to double back y'all, I have been gainfully full-time self-employed for 15 years, like doing my own thing for 15 full years with no lines of credit, no fun, no funding from outside sources, like re really me bootstrapping, right? So I hired this coach and decided I'm going to invest in myself, right? I was going to be Beyonce. I was going to bet on myself. And I go and I say, um, one of the, the first in-person meetings, we had quarterly in-person meetings with this coach. So I go to the first in, uh, the first uh, in-person meeting and one of the first things, the first uh, exercises that she has us do is uh, an exercise about 10Xing our rates. Now, listen, let me tell you something. I have always made very good money, thankfully. I am deeply grateful for that. So I never really had an issue. But when I tell you I came up against my upper limit on this exercise, I came up against my upper limit. 
because I'm sitting here in an audience. This was, you know, one of these big name coaches. I'm sitting here in an audience of, I don't know, 200 people. She's on stage. She's telling me 10X your race. And I'm like, excuse you? I already charged $10,000. Like, um, what are you talking about? What the hell am I going to sell for $100,000, please? What am I going to sell for $100,000? So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Lena, this is resistance. Um, and let me tell you, I, we leave the event. I go home and I'm thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? I'm not going to be able to deliver on this assignment. What the heck am I going to sell for $100,000? Now, this is where generational trauma, personal trauma, comes in because I'm sitting here thinking, I got to throw the kitchen sink at this $100,000. I got to deliver line item after line item after line item after line, line item. And I am not thinking about what Chelsea spoke about. My lived experience is worth. There's value in my lived experience. Okay. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm thinking when I tell y'all, it took me two months to come up with the $100,000 what I was going to sell for $100,000, that $100,000 off, the $100,000 offer. It took me two months to work my nervous system through $100,000, $100,000. Now, this is what I love about how the universe supports me and everybody else. This is what I love about how the universe comes through for you. When I showed up and gave myself over to the $100,000 business, the $100,000 offer, the one thing I was going to sell for $100,000, this 10X. Two months later, I sold it. And not only that, not only two months later did I sell it, I sold that, that to someone who saw me on a stage two years prior to that. They said, I saw you speak in Greenwich, Connecticut two years ago, and we want to hire you to come and do, at this time I was doing uh, social media marketing. I don't do that work anymore, but at the time I was, we want to hire you to come and manage and do our entire social media and execute our entire social media strategy. And I was like, oh my gosh, that taught me a couple of things. Number one, Here's what it taught me. I got to deposit myself, intentionally deposit myself in environments where $100,000 is the norm. That's the baseline for admission, right? That's just what we do to grease the wheels, to open the door. We're walking in the door with $100,000. Where I routinely do not blink when I tell people, you want to work with me one-on-one? -on -one? That's $250,000 for the year. I don't blink. And I don't care. I have more accessible price points, of course, because accessibility matters in my business. But as I said in the chat earlier, everything that you do doesn't need to be accessible. So number one, the first rule that I created after learning I too can 10X is I intentionally deposit myself in environments where $100,000, a million dollars, that's the norm. Those are normal conversations. Those aren't outsized ideas. T.D. Jake says something that I love. He says, greatness is contagious. If you're around it, you'll catch it. And I love that because it's true. When you're in the room where million dollar conversations are being had, eventually you will be having the million dollar conversations. The second rule that I created for myself was I asked myself, I always ask myself when I'm meeting resistance, especially around money, because I still have it. It doesn't go away. Okay. You know, you, I may not be nervous about million dollar conversations, but I'm nervous about $10 million conversations. I'm nervous around $20 million conversations. Absolutely. Right. I always ask myself, what am I making it mean? Lena, what are you making it mean? So, you know, that you're now in this WhatsApp group of real estate developers. And these people are sending each other uh, WhatsApp messages and talking about, yeah, I'm gonna electronically transfer you $5 million today. I'm sending my $7 million investment. And I am thinking, what am I doing in this space? How is it that I'm here? I don't belong here. I don't have $7 million to invest in real estate yet, yet, right? 
So I'm always thinking to myself, Lena, what are you making it mean? And talking myself down. Because if I'm in the space, I would not be here if I wasn't supposed to be here. If I'm in this space, this is where I'm supposed to be, again, intentionally depositing myself. Always please ask yourself, what are you making it mean? Because there's a story that we tell. There's a story that runs in our brains like clockwork about, I'm not worth it. I shouldn't be here. I'm not on this level. These people are better than me. They have more than me. They know what this acronym in real estate investment means. I don't know what the hell this acronym means, right? All of that comes up, right? So you always have to ask yourself, what are you making this mean? The nervousness, what are you telling yourself? Instead of like, oh, I'm on my growth edge. What you'll find is that mean girl from high school in the back of your head talking about some, you don't deserve to be in the space, right? So always ask yourself what, you, what, what you're making it mean. And the third and last rule that I wanna share with you is mind your business. I mind my business. There's a reason that you don't see me all over the internet and everybody's business disputing and arguing and all of this other stuff with everybody. I don't do it. I don't have the bandwidth. I mind my business, literally and figuratively. I don't care what other people are charging. I don't care. I don't even believe in competition because in order to compete with me, you got to be me, right? You can't compete with me if you're not me. In order to compete with me, you got to be me. And honey, you can't be me. I'm the only me, right? So I mind my business. I don't care what other people are charging. I don't care what other people are doing. I don't care about the competition. I don't care about, oh, this is what the market will bear. I don't care about any about that. You know why? Because I charge what I charge. And either you can pay that and you're willing to pay that and you're interested in that or you're not. And either way, it's all good. I'm still going to eat. You're still going to eat. Everything, the world is going to continue tomorrow. The world is not going to end if you decide, oh, well, I don't want to work with Lena or yes, I want to work with Lena. Mind your business. Somebody, I think it was Kara who said earlier, she was like wondering, oh, well, why are, I don't know if these people can afford, you know, what I have to offer or not. Last, I will end on this quick story. Someone came to me, a potential client came to me. This was many years ago. Amazing woman. She came to me and she said, I want to work with you. I want to coach with you. And this is when I thought I was like big stuff, big shot. I had just shifted from social media into like business coaching and that sort of thing. And I thought I was kind of a big shot and I'm, I'm having the sales conversation with her. Right. And she says to me, yeah, you know, I'm a mom of six. Judgment comes in. Judgment enters the chat. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, she's like, I've got, she said she had two sets of twins and then two children, two other children. And I thought, there's no way this woman is going to be able to afford my rates. No, no, no. Let me tell you, not only did she afford my rates, we worked together for like two years and she was a really, really good client. And her products are now on the shelves at Walmart and Target and different places. You know why I underestimated this person? Guess who her ex-husband, her ex-husband, I can't say who he is, but her ex-husband is a well-known country Western star. So here I am in this one, not minding my business, not staying in my lane. And I'm thinking and judging because I was judging, judging this woman who comes to me and says, I have six kids. And I'm thinking there's no way she'll be able to afford me and take care of her six kids. Lena, who do you think you are? Get over yourself. Mind your business. Your rates are your rates. And if people want to work with you, they're going to work with you. So um, that's my five minutes. I hope this helps somebody out there. Please mind your business. Ask yourself, what are you making it mean? And put yourself in environments like this one, like Claire mm -hmm. is creating today, where $100,000 conversations are the norm. Yeah. And now we're all Googling 
which country music star has a six kiss? <laughs> I'm just saying you can Google it and you might be able to figure it out. I think, I mean, there were so many things you said that were incredible. And obviously I'm not the only one who thought that Karen Anderson, I say this every time I hear Lena speak, when is the daily affirmations by Lena app coming out? Uh, but oh. something that I, I mean, there were a few things that you said that really stuck out to me, but the one thing that resonated quite a bit was um, I think you were speaking to sort of the, like we can disrespect our customers by charging too little and make it, so it's not just disrespecting our own value, right? And and transferring, and I had mentioned this in my story of like transferring my scarcity mindset to others, making an assumption that they also could not afford to invest in themselves because that's ultimately what this is. It's, it's not about you. It's about what you're going to do for them. So yeah, that's where I, I'm brilliant. You're fantastic. Um, and I'm going to have Aaron Helper jump up and join us here because uh, Aaron actually is how I know, you know, so we're going to. Yeah. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. And I know you have to hop. Yeah. Um, I was like literally just texting my son. I'm like, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll um, be there in 15 minutes. And you, and you're the founder and CEO of The Upside and you're really like the leading authority on independent consulting. And I know you have some gems to, to share and thank you so much for sticking around everybody. I know we're going a little long. Yeah, well, whether you're here, everyone who knows me knows I like an intimate group of people. So this is totally fine by me. And thank you, Claire, for, for inviting me to share my story. Mine's a little bit short. I thought it was supposed to be five minutes. So I'm I'm sticking to the, the five minutes. But, um, you know, I had been running my own consultancy for about seven years when I first launched The Upside. And when I, I The Upside wasn't originally a community, but I rolled out the community at the end of 2018. But I, I didn't know a lot of people who are building that type of business model. I mean, Claire, you were kind of doing it around the same time, but it was like, people were like, what's a community? It just was a very new business model. People's pricing was all over the place. There weren't that many best practices out there. Um, so I just kind of felt like I was building the plane as I was flying it. And because of that, I assumed, and everyone know, who knows me knows, I don't like when we assume, but I assumed that I needed to start small and charge small because again, I was building the plane as I was flying it. But then again, who isn't? Anyway, there was still this, I guess there was still this part of me that was this girl from a small town in South Carolina who moved up to the big city to make something of herself. I had no connections, no leg up, always needing to prove myself to get the door open for me. And I held on to that person and that identity for about two decades. I just was always that girl who was grateful for the opportunity, for any opportunity, because I just didn't have that many when I moved up to New York City. My parents didn't have connections up there. And I just wanted so badly to be the small town girl that made it into the big city. And I know that's so terribly cliche and there's like Reese Witherspoon movies about that and the whole thing, but there's movies about it for a reason because there's people like me who actually live that life. So I priced our community super low in the beginning. Like I can't even say the number because it's so embarrassing because I just wasn't 100% sure what I was building. I didn't think people would pay that much to be in the community. I didn't think they'd pay that much to have access to me. And back then, like I said, people just didn't even know what a community was. It was hard to even explain what they were paying for. But here's what I didn't take into consideration when I was pricing it out. First of all, how much it costs to run a community business. I don't know. I thought like I was pocketing all of this. Definitely not. To run a community business, it costs a lot of money to do it right. So I had grossly underestimated what my costs were going to be. I also grossly underestimated the advantage of being small and how valuable that intimate time with me was to those early members. They got a lot of Aaron Helper time back then. And I just didn't really understand how valuable that was to them. And lastly, I didn't, and I just couldn't have predicted this, how much positive financial impact the upside would have on our members. I was seeing members closing six-figure deals because of us. I was seeing them 10X their rates, 5X their rates, learning how to, to price their services properly and sell their services properly, making that impact. And I was charging nothing 
to be inside this community. And once I saw that impact, once I then hired our first team member to help run the business, remember I said it costs a lot to run a community business, that's when I raised the rates for all the new incoming members. But I still kept our old members at their original low rate. Why? I had a fear they would leave me. I had a fear that they'd be disappointed in me. I had a fear that I'd be seen as greedy or selfish. And I had a fear that if I raised their rates, I would be doing the wrong thing. But something interesting started to happen. The community space started to grow. There were more and more people coming into the space. They were starting their own communities and they were charging more than I was, but in my view, providing less value. And I started to feel ashamed and embarrassed that they had the confidence to charge what they did and I didn't. And I finally gained the courage to send that email telling our original most loyal members, some of them are here today, Karen, I see you. I finally gained the courage to send that email telling our original most loyal members that were paying like basically nothing that we were raising all of their rates and hitting that send button just about emptied my stomach, to be honest. But here's what happened. We lost one member, one member left. And the rest of them replied to my email with words of gratitude, loyalty, and encouragement. Some of them even said, what took you so damn long? And that was the exact moment that I let go of that girl from the small town in South Carolina who just wanted a chance to make something of herself in the big city. She was a big part of my journey and she was a big part of my hunger for success, but she just no longer served me. And she no longer lives in my head telling me to play small and to be grateful for any opportunity. So I want you, I, I, I don't know, I have like a little interactive exercise. And since this chat is so alive, I'd like you to actually put it in the chat if you're brave. And if you feel a little less comfortable doing that, feel free to write it down on a sheet of paper. But I want you to answer these questions. I have three. The first one is, and I want you to say the first thing that comes to your mind. What would you charge if you knew the other person would say yes? I'm looking at the chat. Ooh, that's so good. I'm looking at the chat. That's so good. Okay, billions. Okay, realistically, what would you charge if you knew the person would say yes? If you knew the person would say yes. Okay, I'm seeing all sorts of numbers. They're all excellent because it's all relative, right? So then my next question for you is, And be honest and dig deep past the surface layer. What's keeping you from asking for that number? What is keeping you from asking for that number that you just threw in the chat or wrote down on the piece of paper? Like fear of rejection, fear, insecurity, fear of what? Assumptions. Remember what I I said it in the chat before. I had a professor that I just adored. He said, When we assume we make an ass out of you and me, and I say that all the time, it is very true. Um, Loss of clients, imposters, uncertainty if they had the budget, loss of clients. Okay. All of these things. What do you think is the worst thing that will happen if you throw out that number? And I'm looking at the chat. What is the worst thing that will happen if you throw out that number? No clients, no clients, won't get the job. They'll laugh. Okay, Carolina hit it right there. They'll laugh and think I'm crazy. That is what most people, and I've been doing this a very long time and I've worked with thousands of consultants. That is what most people really fear. Yes, you fear losing the client. What you really fear is that they will laugh at you and think you're crazy and say in some way, shape or form, you're not worth it. Some version of that, you're not worth it. I would say that almost never happens. It almost never happens. And if and when it does, and that has happened to me before, if and when it does, those people, I promise you, would have been the absolute most nightmare people to work with anyway. I promise, (laughs) Lena, every time, 
Lena and I have known each other for a few years. So she, we, we speak the same, we speak the same language over here every day. They would have been the word you dodged a bullet. Anybody who would make you feel unworthy is a red flag. And I'm going to leave it at that because of our time. And because my phone is ringing with my 11 year old son in town saying, where are you? <laughs> Doing something very important for all of us. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Um, something and feel free to jump off. But one thing I want to pull from what you said was, to, and I'm going to paraphrase, you basically said we underestimate how much it costs us to do the thing. So it's not just focusing on, well, what should I charge? What can they pay? What am I worth? But what are the fucking sacrifices that I have to make emotionally, energetically, financially in order to do this thing or what it took to get to the place in order to do this thing? Um, and that's what they're paying for. So yeah, that I would was say also, and, and Lena and I've talked about this before too, I would say that and the five minutes of advice or five minutes, the idea you came up with in five minutes could make that person millions of dollars. Just because it is easy for me to give advice to people and that my advice makes them so much money, just because it's easy for me, doesn't mean that it should be cheap. Right. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Tina, you're fantastic for being so patient with us here. Um, I know that some folks have needed to drop, but we're going to be sending the recording out. Um, and let me, oh, wait, let me just remove Aaron. There we go. Okay. Zoom is fun. <laughs> Not sort of partly. Thank you, Tina, for being here. Let me give an intro quickly for you. Um, so you have a really interesting story because you're, you're very much a multi-hyphenate. Um, you're a community builder and a creator, you know, strategist. You have a focus on the future of work, mental health, and personal development. And currently you're focused on helping people make a living on their own terms via what you call the freelance starter pack. So it's a cohort where you're teaching people who are debating whether or not they should go freelance and you're really giving them the tools to prepare in order to go forth. And a big part of that, of course, is how am I going to pay my bills? So welcome to the stage. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for all the ladies that went before me. I'm so inspired by all the talks here. I'm learning so much. So thank you so much for all the ladies that went before. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tina Yip. I'm the founder of Strategist, spelled S-T-R-T-G-S-T. -S -T. We host gatherings for people to feel, learn, and grow, help them shift from stuck to inspired. And I also freelance as a community strategist. A bit of a background about myself, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, which meant I needed a visa to work in the US. Um, really fortunately got to do that for a decade, but that also meant I wasn't really in a position to negotiate for the longest time because every time I would bring that up, they would be like, oh, but we're sponsoring your visa. So there's nothing that you know we can do about your salary. And I also just never wanted to jeopardize my status, but that's a whole other story. Um, and fast forward, I got my green card last year. So I peaced out of corporate America. Thanks for the memories. And now I wanna be my own boss and dictate how much I wanna charge. So today I wanna to focus on talking about my program, the Freelance Starter Pack and the journey of raising the rates on it. So just a bit of context and background, Freelance Starter Pack is a fully encompassing program that's 10 weeks plus more for people in creative industries in the middle of their career to go from full-time to freelance. Um, and we go through everything from mindset, business and marketing. And a lot of it is really based on my own experience of um, moving into the wild west doing this. And also a lot of other of my friends who also did the same thing, who want to have more control of their lives and the way that they want to live. And freelancing is really a tool to make that happen. Um, and it has everything from weekly programming, mentorship, tons of experts and instructors involved, um, peer mentorship, accountability, bi-weekly coaching, a lot of things involved. And I, at first when I designed this last year, I was like, okay, I think I want to charge a hundred dollars and thank God for my coach, talk to her about it and shout out to all the coaches in here. Thank you for all of your work and guiding people like me. I was like, oh. I shouldn't charge a hundred dollars. And she was like, you need to charge way more, maybe like at least a thousand dollars. And even just the notion of a thousand dollars scared me a lot. I felt really uncomfortable, never really done that before. And I think a lot of it came from um, guilt and fear that's tangled up 
judgment from other people, scared of what other people would think about me, thinking that I'm greedy and, in, and making something that's inaccessible, judging for myself where I'm like, am I really making something that's valuable at all? The fear that it's actually not that valuable and that I'm not enough. And ultimately needing to work through that by grounding myself and really just trusting that I will never be coming from a place of greed and trusting that I'm always going to be integrity with myself and I'm driven by my values and I just want to help people live their best life and leave their toxic jobs and create a life that they want to live that they get excited about every single day um, and all of that comes from a place of love and care um, and also another thing that has helped me a lot is like shifting from the thinking about like how much I'm charging to a value exchange. And some people like to call it like an energy exchange. That's also quite helpful. And I know that I'm gonna provide immense value to everyone there. And their investment is an exchange for something that they need. And say, if I do charge $100 for my course and I still put my heart and soul in it, I won't be able to co cover my expenses and I'm gonna be really stressed. And I'm actually going to be robbing everyone from their experience because I'm not able to show up properly. So ultimately last year, the first time I did this, I decided to charge 599, which at that time was a number that I felt was a stretch for me and understanding that yes, yes, I can be charging way more. Um, and as Lena said, mind your own business. I, I, like, I, I can be charging way more and all that, but at that time, that was what feel like it was right for me. It was a, still a stretch. I can still be able to fully show up as I'm selling the thing. And I'm not ready for kind of more yet, but I will be. And eventually I did get there. And yes, you can work up to all of these things. Um, so the second time doing this, I charge 1,599 and the third time, uh, which is right now I'm doing 3,999 and a lot of things I think in the last year has helped me kind of keep doing it increasing and I think after the course and putting it out there now that I have more feedback people tell me and affirm me that it is their words life changing it's really valuable and now I feel a little bit more confident about it. And at the same time, whenever I'm doing something, I'm always iterating, I'm always making it better because what I care about the most is creating the most value for people. I'm always making it better. So the third time I did it, which was at 3,999, um, I was actually more stressed and had more anxiety charging the, the 599 point than right now charging 3,999 because I have worked through a lot of my internal struggles, working through my self-worth, my perfectionism, my anxiety. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself, especially in the beginning, thinking that this is an end-all be-all. This is a one, like, if I fail now, I'm gonna, like, the, the world's gonna collapse. And I just put so much pressure on myself. And then realizing, like, hey, it's okay that, like, this is just an experiment. Stop putting so much pressure on myself. Nothing is permanent. Um, and also, like, this company that I'm building and Strategist is also going through a rebrand. I used to do this on the side, now I'm doing it full time. Um, 10 years down the line, when I look back, it's just gonna be, if I do fall flat on my face, it's just gonna be like a blip in a row. It's gonna be like a little pim pimple that like happened and it's, I'm gonna learn from it and it's gonna be fine. Um, and also ultimately, I think charging more also is, I also wanted to be working more with people who are much more committed clients because i think in the beginning when i was charging less there was a mix of people who were just kind of freelance curious not sure whether they want to do this some actually did it and now increasingly i want to specifically work with people who are really serious about it attracting those kinds of people attracting the kind of clientele um and increasing the price and people investing in it who are more serious about it are the wavelength of people that i want to be working with um, and also I think learning to live with fear and being comfortable with fear is also a big thing for me. Now that I have a very clear long-term goal, knowing that I'm building this thing, knowing that this is just the beginning and I'm just learning by doing that I'm getting more and more uncomfortable every time. But now when I, when fear comes up for me, I'm like, I'm not going to let you kind of dictate what I do because I'm fearful. I'm going to be, I'm comfortable with you. I know how to deal with you because I am going down this path where it, the things that I'm doing aligns with my soul and it is what I want to do and it lights me up every single day and it's going to be worth it. So I'm not going to let this fear stop me from doing what I want to do. Um, yeah, so this is my story. I mean, all of this is, 
I mean, all the money is just tangled up in so much emotion, self-worth, and, and increasing your rate is really an act of self-love um, to yourself and also to the people that you're serving. It's just love in general. Um, yeah, that's my personal journey. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Claire, and all of the ladies that have been so inspiring. Um, I have so much more to learn and thank you for having me here. Yes. Yeah. I love this experimental way of looking at your, you know, what you charge, but also just in life in general, anything you do, it's just like practicing for the next time of whatever that experience will evolve into. I also, something I loved, um, was really, you were talking about attracting the right clientele um, which speaks to somebody who mentioned in the chat about fear of their client saying no, losing clients, right? Well, guess what? Maybe you serve less clients, but you make more money because you charge more. So maybe it's okay to lose some people, right? And we heard that as a theme throughout. Thank you, Tina, so much for joining uh, us. Um, we are 22 minutes past time, but I am totally fine with that. And I think about 60 of you also are fine, which is quite a, a few of you. So I would say let's stick around um, for the next eight minutes to make it a good round number. And I would invite anybody who had, and no, you know, we don't feel comfortable talking about it. That's okay. If you had an aha moment today, I would love for you to share that. There was something that was said that got you to think differently or maybe finally reaffirmed, you know, your instinct about something. If there was something that resonated for you, I would love for you to come, you know, and just unmute. Don't all do it at once. Um, I'm actually seeing, yes, go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, hi. Hi, um, my name is Bay. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm a social media strategist um, and I've just entered in the consulting field um, in world. So this is all really new to me. So thank you so much for hosting this um, because setting my price is something that I've really struggled with um, and really wanting to you know, help everyone as much as I can, but also still wanting to get paid, of course, what, you know, what my time is worth. Um, but I something that was really profound for me was um, when Lena was actually speaking, she kind of spoke to like how she was able to ask her price because of the circles that she was in. And it got me to thinking and I'm like, well, how are you? What, what's your problem in the, um, I'm sorry, I missed her name. Um, I think two speakers ago, she asked us those questions. And when I really started to think about those questions, I'm like, okay, why aren't you asking your price? Well, you know, the people that you're, you know, marketing to, they can't afford it. And it's like, well, what are the circles that you're in? Um, so I was like, okay, you're spending a lot of time on Facebook, but how can you get clients, you know, in that realm, if the people that are following you aren't, you know, able to hold up to, you know, their end of the bargain in that's in the price space. So it even just it encouraged me to get back on LinkedIn in, in even a greater scale. Um, as we've been speaking, I've been looking at the other ladies' incredible profiles and like updating my LinkedIn page um, and just seeing kind of how I can uh, mimic some of the things that I'm seeing of the people that are the most successful in the field that I really want to enter into. So I just wanted to say thank you because this has been super helpful and I feel even more confident going into, you know, my next opportunity. So thank you. Yes, yes I love it. And I love that you're updating on LinkedIn as we are, you know, that's at the end of the day, it's relationships that we build, the relationship with ourselves and with each other. And yeah, get in the right rooms or the right Zooms with people who can afford you too. Uh, Naya, uh, it looks like you have your hand up. So I'm going to have you unmute. And if you'd like to share your, any of your, your aha moments for today. I, think I am cool. in a noisy coffee shop, so my bad about that. Um, this was amazing. So I am a brand therapist and I am always working with women who are struggling to communicate their values, afraid of bragging too much. Like I turn my clients into certified braggers who get paid for. So like, I love everything about this. I didn't know I needed permission to also feel like the market, like forget what the market will bear, right? Because I teach my clients not to compete. I teach them to not have competition. So like we have this conversation. I feel like I'm in a conversation almost every other day about pricing. How much should I charge? But what if this, but what if that, all of the anxieties are around it. And it's like, you can't really just copy what other people are doing or try to figure out what, what's happening in the market exclusively because we're designing your service. We're designing you to not be what other people are being. To the person you're looking for, you are solving such a specific problem in such a unique way that nobody else can even compete with that. You have to charge based on what that value and what that solution is going to be to that person. But I guess I just didn't know I needed to hear those words. So Lena, thank you for that. Um, I am up for adoption in any way that makes sense for you. Just you know, throwing that out there. Anyway, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.
Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Tiara. Uh, I'd love for you to join because I think you have a little hand up and then Paula and then uh, we'll close out. Hold on. So you're on, I asked you to unmute, but let's see if we could try it one more again. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for just creating the space for me to feel comfortable to come on camera with no makeup as I'm heading to a spa appointment in a couple of minutes. So thank you for that first. Um, but I also appreciated many of the panelists um, talking about making more money and scaling um, for service-based businesses. That's not something that we hear a lot. Um, it's typically more in the product-based businesses. Um, and I always hear limitations that people give us consultants and service-based businesses um, saying things like we can, we only have so many hours in the day and um, we need a product to really scale. So I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on that um, and if anyone has been successful in adding maybe a digital product or or physical product to their consulting um, or service-based business. I don't know if I can unmute. I think people can unmute themselves, right? I don't think I need to, I don't know. If, do you yeah. mind just asking the question one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's just about with, when it comes to consulting companies specifically, is there anyone on the call that's been successful in adding a, product to their service or to their offerings. Um, that's something that I'm kind of working on, but then hearing all the ladies here, maybe I don't need to do that. Maybe just increase my consulting rates and not worry about a product. So I'm, now I'm kind of really, really stuck in the middle. So I'm just curious if anyone has been successful adding a product to their consulting um, offerings. I would say if anyone wants to, if you're able to answer that, jump in the chat and, and answer it. I would, because my response to you would be um, try to come up with um, ways that you can test the idea. Um, so floating, you know, coming up with the idea of the product and then asking some previous clients or current clients, you know, if we were to do this, I'm, you know, what is your need for it and how much would you be willing to pay? So instead of feeling like you need to make a decision on whether or not to do it, I would focus more on how to design experiments to get more information that will then make you feel incredibly confident. So I think oftentimes, and, we'll, and I say this every day, but it's, I think it's so good. The Latin root for the word confidence is to trust. Okay. And I think for us to really trust ourselves and our decisions, we sometimes just need more information, right? You need more proof that you are heading in the right direction so that you can trust to move forward. So I would say that would be my first next steps. Thank you. Yeah. Talk to them, see what, see what clients want. Thank you. That's super helpful. And Paula Taylor, welcome. Um, I see that you put your hand up. If you'd like to join, I would love to hear your, your story, your aha moment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my aha moment was mm, trying not to judge or not judging the capacity to pay. Um, I, don't, I forget who said it, but you know, her, she had six kids. That's what I get, you know, in the weeds with all the time. Like I'm a feminist and oh, you know, this person is not working now, or this person is old, and this person is that, and then, and then I, I, I lose my courage kind of to raise my rates or charge what I think I'm worth. And recently I was in an alignable um, conference and this woman said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a life coach. She said, well, you should just, I'm not getting clients, just like offer your course for free and then get testimony. And that really rubbed me the wrong way. I, I don't know if anybody else has, you know, had done that. Or, uh, it is that I am so glad that you brought that up because I think this goes to the, um, it's not an either or, it's an and, um, and it's ever evolving. So I host, and I'm, I'm, as you all know, I'm very transparent. So I'm just being real with you guys. So I, we host a lot of free stuff. Every Monday, I host a job seeker support group. Um, I'm now going to be doing, you know, I do lives every day. I'm inviting coaches on, you know, this is free. Uh, although last minute I was, I added a donation option because I was like, oh God, I should be maybe less hypocritical here. And, uh, you know, but I love that we do things for free to get people in the door. They sign up. Signups are money for us. Not technically, but we leverage the number of people in our community to get sponsorship from brands. 
So, and then also we've increased the pipeline to paid products, right? If more people know about ladies, get paid and participate and trust the brand. Then if I offer, you know, a higher priced product that is a value, theoretically, we have more people to market to. So we should see a higher conversion, theoretically. However, and this speaks to why it rubbed you the wrong way, Paula, and I agree with you. We're also training people to not pay us. We are also shooting ourselves in the foot and being, and I'm using my own word of hypocrite again, of like, you know, teaching people to invest in themselves, but wait, don't invest in me, right? And it's not sustainable. So it's really every decision you make around, I think, pricing, it needs to be contextual and strategic. And the decision you make today, it's not actually about today. It's about how is this setting you up for tomorrow? So if I am not getting paid from this person or not getting paid much from this person, this better bring other kinds of value to me. Like again, testimonials. I mean, how many do you truly need? Like maybe you do need a few, right? Cause I, I said yes to speaking gigs that didn't pay me much or anything in the very beginning. I mean, again, but that's why it's evolving. It's evolving. And that's why I really wanted this to be a more kind of open forum type conversation um, because it is so personal uh, and so contextual. And I wish that I had more time, well, we had more time here, but I, I think we'll wrap it up now and I'll just say thank you so much for being here. Um, the last thing I would just, I have a couple of points that I would want to just share with you all, questions that I ask myself before I put my pricing out there. And by the way, there's a difference in the process of determining your pricing and how you articulate it. Because you can always do payment plans um, or do scholarships or, you know, it's like, again, it's not either or, it's an and. But here are some questions I ask myself. So have I done sufficient market research? Like, do I feel truly confident? Do I trust the numbers I've seen and how I fit in that market? Slash, am I more in the Lena camp of like, there's no competition, okay? But sometimes it's like, am I talking to enough people here? Am I talking to the right people here? Okay then what's the return on investment on my service? So, or the value that I'm providing this person or this company, what are they going to get out of it? How much money, like translated into dollars, literally, this is how you're going to make a strong case for a salary negotiation at a full-time company is you are effectively demonstrating to them that you have impacted the business bottom line. Same thing if you have a personal client. Um, of course, it's different if it's a product, like if you're selling a bracelet, right? They're not going to make money from your bracelet. That's more, you know, just personal joy and fulfillment. But do ask yourself, what is the kind of return on investment or some kind of quantifiable gain that the other person is going to take from my services? What are the sacrifices I'll need to make to actually do this? This speaks a little bit to what Aaron was mentioning, right? Um, how much does it cost to operate this business? What am I saying no to? Like if I'm doing this town hall, that therefore I am not doing other things. And also I'm going to be tired after this, right? So do think about the energy that it requires to do this kind of work, not just in the moment, but for like the compounded time after, okay? Will it be worth it? Will this money be worth it? Will it breed resentment? Kara Stevens kicked us off today with that word, resentment. Besides money, okay, what will this opportunity afford me? Now you pick the number. The last, the question I want to ask is myself is, is this the core reason to charge this amount? Am I doing this to shield a potentially more difficult feeling? And I had mentioned this earlier, right? I'm choosing this small amount because of inclusivity. I'm going to call bullshit. It's really more imposter syndrome. What rejection, you know, if I'm afraid of rejection to my self-esteem, what am I deeply afraid of? Like what's at the core of that? And so this goes more into cognitive behavioral therapy type exercises of really uncovering the layers of your resistance. Uh, and then the last thing is, is if inclusivity really is a core concern, you know, have I offered other opportunities like free event scholarships, payment plans? How does this all fit in again, more holistically to everything I'm doing? And the last piece that I would just, you know, that little trick that I remind myself is I think back to, to years in the past when I would quote a very large number and be really scared of it, but how now that number looks so cute. It's so small. And so that means today, the number that I quote that frightens me I imagine myself in the way future, looking back at this moment, thinking, oh, how cute, you know, again, it's ever evolving as we evolve. So that's why, please, I hope that you take from this just the, the courage to continue the conversation with people in your life. You are doing them a, a service, okay? Same thing with what you charge. If you charging, if you're afraid of 
missing out or you're lowering the wages for the rest of us. Like we do not want to teach customers and our employers that this is a race to the bottom. And unfortunately, you know, we're not getting into like macroeconomics and capitalism here, but like, unfortunately there does sometimes feel like there's a bit of a rat race of like, whoever's the cheapest, you know, will sell the most. And we've got to just all together collectively agree not to do that, not to underbid each other and really look at your, the number you put out there as PR for yourself. So when you charge too low, that kind of looks like you don't value yourself. So again, everything's contextual. You're going to, you know, examine this stuff at all angles and you're going to change as you, you know, things will change and you will change your pricing accordingly. But again, do remember that I think there is a, a collective responsibility that we have to each other to not underbid. Ladiesgetpaid.com. It is free to join, although there is an upgrade option. I'm going to be emailing you all today with the recording as well as an invite to next month's town hall, um, which is called What's in Your Toolbox? Uh, and it's resources, books, modalities, experiences, podcasts, and people who have helped you own your worth. So we're gonna have a lot of coaches there. So anything and everything that you have maybe tried, uh, that's been helpful for you in owning your worth, which of course is a huge topic and um, be in touch, come to that, sign up for it. Uh, and also pro membership. We have a pro membership and I'm going to be emailing you details around that. I'm Claire gets paid on Instagram and also ladies get paid on Instagram. Also, by the way, we are putting together a podcast and we are taking audio from these town halls um, to include. So you'll also be getting an email when that episode comes out. Thank you all so much. Uh, there's We also have an online network. So I know y'all are changing, exchanging LinkedIn's as you should, but I do hope that you will join our free online network. And that is a place to stay in touch because this chat was fire and I don't want to, I don't want to lose it. All right, guys. Thank you all so much ever evolving. Remember, it's all an experiment. Okay. And whatever you learn, share it with somebody else. So maybe post on LinkedIn after this, your aha moments, you'll get into people's feeds that way. That's good for you, but you're also sharing the knowledge. So pass it on. All right. Now go get paid.